Let me ask you a question. Have you ever felt like your faith was invisible? Have you ever felt that what God has given you to do was not having any effect on people? That you know you love God, you want to be a part of Him, you want Him to be a part of you, but for whatever reason, it doesn't seem to go beyond Sunday morning. And it just doesn't seem like maybe God's given you the gift to make it go any farther than that. You know, and you see people all the time, right? You see people all the time that, that just have a knack for this and putting a word out there and bringing people in. Like all they have to say is believe in Jesus Christ and they say, okay, I'm so glad you shared the message with me. And it just, it's so easy, it seems. But for whatever reason, it just doesn't seem to work with you. You know, on this day with honoring our seniors, a lot of the messages that I'm presenting to you, I really want you to hear it. Because going out into the world, you're going to be faced with an identity crisis. An identity crisis that says, who am I going to follow? What part of my life is going to be most important? What part of my life do I desire to be most visible to people? Of course, then you start talking about that. Maybe it's not just the seniors. Maybe it's all of us. Is there a part of your life, namely your faith, that people just don't understand and you have no idea how to communicate it to them. The invisible Christian. The invisible Christian. You see, we're talking this morning about ownership. Taking your faith and making it something that is yours. Seniors, not your parents' faith, not your grandparents' faith. Teens, not anyone else's faith but yours. It's something that I can say it belongs to me. If you look up ownership, common definition, to indicate oneself as the, as, as the sole agent of some activity or action. Another common definition would be possession. To possess something. To claim it. To say, this is mine. And there's a level of care that you put into something that has ownership. You know, it's not something that you throw around flippantly. You know, it, it's something that you want to take care of. And you want to make sure that, that it's being correctly fed or, or that it's, uh, it's clean, that its appearance is positive, that it's serving its purpose. When I think of ownership, I like to think about a house. You know, uh, I think about uh, the, the labor that goes into owning a house, but, you know, man, is it worth it. Uh, not too long ago, uh, my wife, Bree, and I went through that process for the first time of, of buying a house. And let me tell you, there are some, there are some winners out there. There are some winners out there. And, and we, we, were, we really had a tough decision in trying to buy a house. But also on the flip side, there were some that we saw, mm, maybe not so much. You know, this one was not a looker, you know. Um, the, the downstairs was roomy, but you get upstairs and just something doesn't feel right, you know. And then, you, you know, you got this one. It does come with a chain link fence. We were happy about that. Um, but, you know, too much, too much breeze coming in, you know, too, too, much, too much in, um, you know. And then you can go with that one. Um, the real selling point with this one was that it had satellite TV. You can see there, you know. Um, that was really the, the, the big thing. Um, and it's off the ground, you know, right? Um, we finally settled on this one. And I won't go through all of the details, but I will tell you, it was a lot more labor-intensive than I ever thought it was. And those that have bought a few houses in your time period know what I'm talking about. It was very difficult to go through the whole process of signing all the paperwork. And even once we signed all the paperwork, they made a mistake on one page. So we had to go back and do the whole thing again. I see some people shaking your head like, mm-hmm, yep, that's happened to me too. Yep. Home buying is not an easy process. 
you know? Is it really worth all that trouble, right? I mean, to go through so much stress and difficulty to what? So you can have four walls. I mean, what's the big deal? But anybody will tell you, myself included, oh, does it feel good to have a place to call your own? It feels so wonderful to go home, to put a key in a door and open it, and, and I can say that, that this belongs to my family and I'm raising my family here, my, my child, and, and I can invite people over and I can host them and, and I can have Bible studies in my house and it's a wonderful thing to say, yes, this is, this is something that, that belongs to me. And it was worth all that trouble. It was worth it. I'll tell you, the Christian life is not something that you can just decide to do and it's all meadows, fields, rainbows. There's going to be some trouble. You can count on it. There's going to be some hard times. There's going to be some difficult moments and you have to decide, is it worth it? You know, because that's the difference between being someone that's a fan or a follower. You know, I'm here on Sunday morning and I love what we talk about, and I'm a fan. I'm a fan of Jesus. But are you a follower? Are you someone that takes ownership of what goes on here? That you take it upon yourself to say, this is mine because God has given it to me. He has blessed my life with this place. And it's not something that I just show up and and then leave when it's all over. Okay? You can do that at a concert. You can do that at a ball game. This is not either one of those. The Christian walk is not either one of those. It's about ownership. Taking control of something that God has given to you and say, use it. Spiritual Ownership. Let me give you a few windows and maybe to your own spiritual ownership. You know, windows, mind you. You know, what is the one song that we sing in worship that always seems to encourage you or build up your faith? You got some that are, that are coursing through your head right now? What is the one thing that you always like to pray about whenever you talk to God? Something that you, you can't end your prayer, you know, you have to say it, you know, and it's, it's unique to you. I have to talk to God, and when I do, this is what I say. If someone came to you and asked you about the Bible, what verse would you tell them that means the most to you? You know, there's that one verse that almost defines you, you know, like God said, hey, I'm giving you my word, and I really want this one to stick out because it carries a message that I know you're going to understand and relate to. Number four, how do you handle situations where people are encouraging you to do something that goes against God's plan for us? What's your attitude towards that? You know, is it hate? Is it, is it you know, standoffish? Is it I don't do anything? Or, or is it something where you're able to say, I, I disagree with that, and I'm okay if we disagree? Ownership. These are windows into your world of ownership, of your faith. Now, they're just windows, though. Because, you see, ownership is something that takes action. It can't all just be something that happens up here. You know, God commands us to take action and to move forward with our faith in a physical way. I don't want to get into the avenue, though, where we get into heaven by our actions alone. But I'm telling you, it's pretty difficult to have one without the other. Matthew 13, 44 through 46. The kingdom of heaven is like a treasure hidden in a field. When a man found it, he hid it again. And then in his joy, he went and sold all he had and bought that field. Wow. Pretty intense. Again, the kingdom of heaven is like a merchant looking for fine pearls. When he found one of great value, he went away and sold everything he had and bought it. Let's, let's modernize that for you, if, if you will. Say we're in a, in, in a Goodwill or a thrift store or something, you know, and, and you see a Jackie Robinson rookie card. For those of you that know baseball, that would be a very rare find, a very expensive find, you know? So, so you don't just buy it and, and put it in a, in a container. No, he's saying 
it would be like someone in going and seeing that card and saying, okay, I want to make sure that that's mine, so I'm going to go and buy the whole store. You know, I'm going to buy the whole, the whole thrift store to make sure that that right there is something that can belong to me. Right? That's crazy, isn't it? The kingdom of heaven is like a merchant looking for fine pearls. When he found one of great value, he went away and sold everything he had and bought it. Ownership. It's not about just claiming that something is yours. It's about saying, I would be willing to give up every single thing I have to make sure that my faith is taken care of that my God is promoted in a way where he shines through my life. Ownership. How do you own your faith? Three things that I see in ways that you own your faith. Number one, you let it change you. You let it change you. You let it come upon you. And it's not just words on a page. It goes beyond interesting statistic percentage of students that drop out of church when they graduate the percentage of students that drop out of church when they graduate meaning they might grace a church door again maybe on Christmas on Easter but it never becomes something that is a part of them 65 percent 65% that number is high why why is that so high why are teenagers when they get a chance to make their own decisions after being a part of something for so long Bible times Bible hour, Bible classes VBS, camps, mission trips they decide to go out on their own they never enter a church again There is something that's not working. There is something from birth to graduation that is not seemingly getting the point across that, hey, this is something that is about you. It's something that we need to take an interest in to say, I need him. I cannot live without him. For some reason, for 65% of the teens in this United States, that message is not being communicated to them. The number one reaction from non-believers to believers. There's a book that's called Unchristian. I've used it before by a man named David Kitteman. He's the one that wrote it. It was a part of a bigger, uh, a bigger research group called the Barna Group. They took hard facts, research, evidence. They took surveys, uh, polled all sorts of different age groups within the church, outside of the church, just about their reactions to church, and even why they're not at church. The number one reaction from non-believers to believers as to why I don't want to go to church anymore. Why should I believe you? You're a hypocrite. Now, I have to be careful with this because it's kind of a loaded response, you know? Because truthfully, aren't we all hypocrites? Don't we all make mistakes? Don't we all resemble a portion of ourselves that used to be something? And God just, Jesus, just like our prayer was led because of that blood, He washes those things away. I think it goes a little bit farther than that, though, brothers and sisters. This is a picture that I took from that same book. Few young outsiders see differences in Christian lifestyles. 84% say that they know a Christian personally. Only 15% said that they saw lifestyle differences. Why should I believe you? You're a hypocrite. Yes, we are. But there's a difference between being a hypocrite and living like you're saved. 
isn't there? There's a difference between saying, I've messed up, but I'm not going to do anything about it, and saying, I've messed up, but my life is better because of Jesus Christ. Big difference. And apparently it's a difference that only 15% of young outsiders see among their friends, their family, their congregations. No Christian personally is a huge number. Christians are everywhere. But I'll tell you, Christians that live like they're saved are few and far between. Something needs to be different. James 2, 14 through 17. What good is it, my brothers, if a man claims to have faith but no deeds? Can such faith save him? Suppose a brother or sister is without clothes and daily food. One of you says to him, go, I wish you well, keep warm and well fed, but does nothing about his physical needs. What good is it? In the same way, faith by itself, if it is not accompanied by action, is sick, hurting, in a coma, no, dead. If we are sitting here this morning thinking, I'm great with God, everything is as it should be, and we go out into the world and do nothing to show how good God is, our faith, according to verse 17, is dead. Harsh, harsh words. But words that we need to hear. A movie that came out not too long ago, 2006, called Glory Road. Anyone seen this movie? It's a pretty good movie. Pretty good movie. Um, about the first all African American uh, NCAA basketball team that went all the way, uh, you know, won it all. Um, huge, huge uh, moving story um, and changed the way the game was played forever. Um, at one point, though, before this team even was generated, it was even a thought process. This uh, character right here, the coach of that team, went to go and find recruits. Well, he was finding that there were these African-American young men that were being looked over. And one of them, after the coach went up to him and, and, and said, I want you to be on my team. I don't know why people are looking over you. You need to be a part of this. You're good. Um, I want to start you. And he turns around and, and he says, no, I'm, I'm giving up. It's too hard. Okay? I'm so tired of being, being the back door. I'm so tired of people slamming a door in my face and saying, no, you can't do this. I'll go do something else. Maybe I'll even run for president. You know? But... I love this game, but I'm so tired of people getting in my way. And so he says, I'm going to quit. And the coach, without missing a beat, goes, Hey, you talk a good game, but does it go any farther than that? Do you do more than just talk a good game? The ways in which you pray ways in which teens, college students, that you do your school, is it more than just talking a good game? What about our friendships? Do we understand that it's not just about what we say, but it's about what we do? What about our relationships? Is God the center? Because if it's not, you bring them to church and they're not going to understand why you're here. Do you do more than talk a good game? Let the word of Jesus Christ change you. Number two, do not be ashamed. Don't be ashamed of what God is doing in your life. Don't make it something that you have to hide. Don't make it something that you're afraid to let people know about what's going on. I mean, this is God we're talking about, right? You see, there's a label. That's why I said that whole thing about hypoc being hypocritical, you know, we got to be careful about that because there's a label. And I'll tell you, there are people and ways in which the church has been given that label and does not deserve it at all. But I'll tell you, according to UnChristian, I love this quote, we cannot hope to shed our hypocritical label if our lifestyles offer no proof of the fruit of Christ's likeness. 
how are people going to understand that it's not about being hypocritical, it's about how God cleanses the hypocritical? Unless we are showing people and we are not ashamed to say, let me tell you how I used to be, not how I am. Let me tell you how I used to be and how far God has taken me from, from there. We can't hope to shed our hypocritical label if our lifestyles offer no proof of the fruit of Christ's likeness. What fruit are you telling people about, church? What fruit are you telling people about? What ways are you communicating with the people in your life? Man, God is good. They got to see that. They got to see intensity. They got to see excitement. This is God we're talking about here. And He changes my life every single day. 1 Timothy 4, 15 through 16. Be diligent in these matters. Give yourself wholly to them so that everyone may see your progress. Watch your life and doctrine closely. Persevere in them because if you do, you will save both yourself and your hearers. Do you have to be a preacher? No. Do you have to be a worship leader? No. Do you have to participate in the service? at all? No. Because if your life shows the love of Christ, that's all God needs to work. That's all that needs to be done. I tell you, if anyone gets up on this stage, I hope it's not because they're asked to or just because they're asked to, but it's because they want to. They have a desire to show the love of Jesus Christ. I know that's the reason I'm up here. Because when we walk out that door, we're representing Jesus with every step that we take. Are people being communicated by you that you have to go to church or that you desire to go to church? Is there any communication at all? Here's a phrase that gets tossed around right now. It's called closet Christianity. It's easy to be a Christian behind closed doors, right? Just like we are today. It's easy. I, there's, there's no hesitation at all, man. I, there's 100% of people in here that desire to be here because they have a desire to be close to God. That can't be all of it, can it? Winston Churchill says a wonderful quote, and I think we can apply it. You have enemies. Good. That means you've stood up for something sometime in your life. Do you know there's no promise in the scriptures that says you will not make enemies by relating yourself to Jesus Christ, by connecting yourself to him? You will come across people that do not like you and do not want to have any part of you. Are we ashamed of Jesus Christ? Seniors, if you haven't already, you're going to have to make a choice at some point in your life. What kind of Christian am I going to be? A closet Christian. One that only worships God when it's convenient or when it's easy? Or does it become something more that becomes a part of who you are as a person? Maybe we should keep Romans 1 verse 16 at hand at all times for these kinds of that, uh, moments. I am not ashamed of the gospel because it is the power of God for the salvation of everyone who believes. To not be ashamed means to believe that the power of God is real. And to believe the power of God is real, it means making sure that God is able to work in every aspect of your life, leaving nothing out. I got this from Neva's Facebook, so thank you for this. The world doesn't read the Bible, they read Christians. What are your actions saying about Jesus Christ? What are you communicating to people about how wonderful Jesus is to you? What stories are you telling people? 
about how the saving grace has made your life something worth living. Number three, prepare to be bold. How do we not be ashamed? We allow ourselves to be bold. Peanuts. Gotta love the comics. Used to read it every morning. Do you ever pray, Lucy, says Linus. Well, that's kind of a personal question, isn't it? Are, are you trying to start an argument? I suppose you think you're pretty smart, don't you? I suppose you think... You're right. Religion is a very touchy subject. To communicate Jesus Christ in your life, you better believe it's going to take some boldness. Why? Because according to that graph of those people that they polled, there's only a very small percentage of people that are actually doing that. It's going to take boldness. And people might respond in a way that says, you think you're better than me? A John Hancock, we normally refer to, when someone says, give me your John Hancock, what do they want? Signature. We, that has become slang because of how John Hancock signed his name on what? Hey, we got some history people in here. Good for you. His is the signature that stands out most. You have everyone else's name says, No, John Hancock. He was asked later, Why did you sign your name so big? Like, because I wanted to make sure that England knew that I was a part of this. I didn't sign my name really. No, this is me. You better believe that I believe everything that's written above. Check this out. Galatians 6, verse 11. You know, sometimes you're reading and you come across something, like, man, I've never read that before. I've read it, but I don't think I've ever gotten the message of it. Chapter 6, verse, verse 11. Let me lead into it. He talks about being, uh, do not be deceived. God cannot be mocked. A man reaps what he sows. Let us not do weary in doing good. Therefore, if you have an opportunity, let us do good to all people, especially those who belong to the family of believers. Well, sir, here in verse 11, it says, See what large letters I use as I write to you with my own hand. He's communicating to them and saying, Are you getting this? Because you should pay attention to it. This is not, you know, college-ruled, tiny letters. No, this is a big deal. Do you see what large letters I use to write to you with my own hand? Do we have boldness in the way we represent God to the world so that people have no question as to who you are and whose you belong to? Right? My house, right? I take care of it. I protect it. I have a security system. I mow the lawn sometimes. We take care of, of the siding of it. We clean the inside. We clean the out. I hold that house to be something that is mine simply because of the way I hope people see that I care for it. How do you care for your faith? What actions are defining your faith as something that says this is mine? Is there a level of boldness? I'm an avid eBayer. You have lots of options before you get on to sell something. One of the most expensive options is what? Bold. It's a whole two dollars. To bold your auction, and it says to, how, what does it say? I know it's kind of small. Attract buyer's attention by making the title of your listing appear in bold. It says, hey, I want to sell this, and I'm going to go the extra mile to make sure it gets sold. I want you to see what I have, because it's good. You know, if we're not bold with our faith, people may not be interested in it. They may not have a desire to be a part of it if our life is not saying, man, this is good stuff. I'm not shying away from it at all. This is who I am. This is a part of me. And I go to great lengths 
to make sure I honor God and other people will see that. Of course, it's not about what we do, is it? It's about the way that God is using our hearts to communicate to other people. Isaac Newton, no great discovery was ever made without a bold guess. Faith isn't quite a guess, but it doesn't mean the proof is any easier to find sometimes, does it? Sometimes it's hard to discover what God is actually doing. But I will tell you, to be bold in the face of situations where the world would tell you you have every reason to curse God, to call upon his name in a negative way, to get rid of him in your life, and then to turn around and say, no, that's not me. I don't rely on proof. It's not about what God can do for me. It's about what I can do for him. The ways that I can show God who he is. It's ownership. It's who I am. Luke 11, 5 through 10. He said to them, suppose one of you has a friend and he goes to him at midnight and says, friend, lend me three loaves of bread because a friend of mine on a journey has come to me and I have nothing to set before him. Then the one inside answers, don't bother me. The door is already locked and my children are with me in bed. I can't get up and give you anything. I tell you, though he will not get up and give him the bread because he is his friend, yet because of the man's boldness, he will get up and give him as much as he needs. So I say to you, ask and it will be given to you. Seek and you will find. Knock and the door will be opened to you. For whoever asks receives, he who seeks finds. And whoever to him who knocks the door will be open. You see, he didn't respond just because he knew the man. He said, wow, it's late at night. This must be serious. You see, our boldness will communicate to people how serious we take our faith. Freedom lies in being bold. What is freedom? Freedom is self-awareness. That I don't allow other people to dictate the life that I lead. I don't allow other people to dictate the kind of faith that I have. Because why? Because it's mine. I take control of it and I make it something that not only changes my life, but I have a desire to change the lives of the people around me. What does 2 Corinthians 3.12 say? Therefore, since we have such a hope, we are very bold. What hope do you have today? What kind of hope? I guess it's time for me to stop. That's what the lights mean, right? Since we have such a hope, we are very bold. I urge you, use your hope Use your desires. Use the freedom that you have in Christ to drive how visible Jesus Christ is in your life. And when people see that, they're going to ask, why do you care so much? Why is this something that you cannot help but to proclaim with your decisions, with your lifestyle? Why do you feel like you have to be so different than me? Are we ready to answer that question? seniors are you ready to go out into the world and answer that question for people are you ready to make your faith your own and not somebody else's church is your faith your own or does it belong to somebody else does it belong to the world I urge you to make your faith something that resembles this. Philippians 12, starting in verse 12. Start, chapter 2, starting in verse 12. Therefore, my dear friends, as you have always obeyed, not only in my absence, but now much more, not only in my presence, but now much more in my absence, continue to work out your salvation with fear and trembling because it is God who works in you to will and to act according to his good purpose. You know, what we did at the beginning with Zach, who did an excellent job, by the way, it's something that, yeah, it was, we were pretending. But man, the number of times that I've withheld Christ from people because I was afraid of what? How they were going to react, how they were going to respond. 
what kind of questions they were going to ask. Fear of representing God in a positive way. What if they ask me, what if they call me a hypocrite? How do I respond to that? I tell you, the number of times I have withheld Christ from people is staggering. We cannot be a part of God's church without being a part of that 12, 13%. We cannot be just people in which they know that we are Christian and that's as far as it goes. It's got to be something more. We cannot be afraid of what Jesus Christ is going to do through you. I ask you this morning, are you being bold? Are you taking what's in this book and making the words jump off the page and into your heart and into your words and into your actions because that is the only way that people are going to see that Christ still has power today. It comes from you. We normally end our service with an invitation, and this will be no different. But as I offer this invitation, I really, really want you to consider your own ownership of faith. Where are you? Where do you find your desires? Where do you find your conversations lead? Do we ever take the initiative to turn a conversation at our workplace into, let me tell you what the Lord has done for my life this week? Our schools, teens, do we ever take the initiative? to even mention the name of Jesus Christ among our peers. It's hard, as Zach so eloquently said, and we need the support of one another to do this. But standing united and not being afraid of what lies outside those doors is going to grow the church without fail. If you need to respond this morning in prayer, in struggle, in frustration, if you need to cry out to God and have the elders of this church pray for you because you have a desire to own your faith again. If you've never answered the call and you want to immerse yourself in the waters of baptism so that you can understand what it means to own something as beautiful as the promise of eternal life and having that blood wash away your sins. We can do that today. The elders will be passing through the aisles. Just grab one of them. Let them know what you need. They'll also be in the back. Whatever your need is, let's use this time and correct any ownership.